people who've never had a weight related problem don't understand how powerful words can be both using just the, the small word of calling someone fat compared to understanding that they might have fat, but they are not fat. Um, or to say, oh, you know, when we go out tonight, we'll take him along because at least we know that there'll be nothing left on the table. Um, and turning it around and taking the power out of their words and putting them into your own is the only way that a lot of us could cope. So accepting the fact that, yes, we were going to get cold fat or we were going to be made fun of our size if we were the first people to do that then no one else had the power to make you feel bad you've already chosen to accept that this is what it is and then you move past it so then their comments become less and less powerful but at the same time you're reinforcing that negativity back into your own mentality that is will Viser this week on the do it for yourself podcast How's it going? Welcome or welcome back to another episode here on the Do It For Yourself podcast. I just wanted to say thank you so much for tuning in. Whether this be your first time here or you are one of my loyal returning listeners, I appreciate you coming over to take this little journey through another amazing story of someone who is doing it for themselves. This week, my guest is Will Viser, and I discovered Will on Instagram, and I discovered him because I follow a page called Weight Loss Stories, um, and I started following this page back when I started my journey, and I've really enjoyed um, following along with all of the journeys that they post on their page because that's that's what it is. It's just a page posting other people's stories and it's actually how I got in touch with Ethan, one of the previous podcast guests that I've had and I saw Will's transformation and I knew that I wanted to reach out to him and so I had the chance to get connected with him and we ended up scheduling out a time um, to jump on Skype. And once the interview starts, you will hear that uh, Will is actually not from the States. Um, and so we had to do this via Skype and we connected, had a great, great conversation. Um, and we get a chance to kind of weave through Will's story and where he was when he started and kind of how he got up to the weight that he got up to. And he didn't realize it at the time until it was almost too late. Um, and how he then started to make a change and, and really transform his life for the better. And so this was a conversation that I really, really enjoyed. I feel like I say that every time, but I enjoy all of these conversations, and I'm really looking forward to sharing Will's story with you. So without further ado, here is Will's transformation story. I am joined by Will this evening, and Will and I got uh, connected via Instagram, and when I saw his transformation photo, uh, I, I think I sent him a message almost immediately after seeing the transformation photo because it was just an absolutely amazing transformation. And, and I really connected with what he was talking about in the caption that was written there. So, Will, I just want to take a minute to say thank you so much here for jumping on and, and uh, getting connected with me. I know that uh, given the time change between where we are, things are a little difficult. So thanks so much for being flexible and uh, coming on the, the podcast this evening or afternoon Lucky. for you. <laughs> um, so why don't you do me a favor and kind of just uh, introduce yourself and let us know, um, you know, where you're jumping on from, um, what you're up to, and kind of some things that are going on right now. So currently sitting in the future in Victoria, in uh, Australia, um, taking my lunch break so I can have a little chat now. Um, yeah, trying to work out sort of where I focus over the next two months as I'm about to head into my
Um, but yeah, um, 43 nearly, or oh, in two weeks. Um, and just uh, constantly striving to probably be the best, healthiest, fittest version of myself that I can be after spending almost 30 years being obese and not being able to enjoy the life that I had. Yeah, absolutely. And so you said that you're you know, currently taking your lunch break, so you do work a, a full-time job. And is that a full-time desk job? Is there f- Obviously, there's flexibility involved there. Um, but what does your, your day-to-day kind of day-in, day-out look like currently? So the easiest way to explain what I do is, is it, it's a day-to-day desk job, but I'm on call 24-7. Um, and I'm the operations manager for the radio network that the emergency services use to communicate. So we make sure that they can do their jobs over, and save lives. Over the radio? Yeah, so um, okay. the handheld radio, like mm-hmm. like what you see police using running around the streets, those yeah. sort of radios, and in the cars and ambulance data terminals and all those sort of things, yeah. So, yeah, I would imagine you, you have to be on call 24 7 and i would imagine that that you get some phone calls kind of in the middle of the night and at just at any hours of the day for for things that aren't working so i'm sure we'll get a chance to talk about how that could uh potentially impact your you know training and getting to the gym and and motivation at sometimes i'm sure if you yeah. get a call at four o'clock in the morning yeah, it's definitely a, um you know fitness and health has to be the priority so I make sure that no matter what my day has been like, whether I've been on call, whether I've you know, had other family commitments or things like that, that it still has to be done. And so um, I want to kind of get back to and start with your uh, childhood, kind of like early teens and, and through there, because um, you kind of said in some of your Instagram posts that you were always the, you know, the funny and, and fat kid and you you were always making the jokes and you know it, it kind of came across that way so could you talk to me a, a little bit about um you know what your your schooling and, and you know what your interactions were like with your peers um during that that point in time and kind of where you were um as far as your weight goes as well yeah well i was always the my kid but being the the taller kid as well and the kid who was always a bit more built than most other kids I attracted a lot more attention so it was either sink or swim in relation to being happy and funny or letting the kids who would pick on you see that it would get to you so um, all the way through I've, I've played hockey and things like soccer um, and I was on sports teams but I was always you know three or four inches taller than everybody else I was always four or five clothes sizes bigger than the same kids my age and I, I, you know, I'm six foot two and a half tall, um, currently sitting at about 225 pounds. So, you know, I'm not a, you know, I'm just going to be that larger framed kid. And as growing up, no matter what I ate, no matter what I did, the weight was always pretty stable. And I was always quite, you know, the, those couple of sizes bigger than everybody else. And that sort of made me the target. So the easiest way to cope with that was to be the clown instead of actually being the target and turn it into something positive and use it as a way to sort of deal with what I look at now as, you know, childhood bullying, which I didn't really see at the time. I just thought that's what happened. Um, So running around on the sports fields and I swam as well in school team um, and played tennis, quite active, but still just, you know, that larger kid that tried to make the best out of everything because it was just an easier way to cope. And so being as you were an an active kid, would you say that there were dietary kind of things that were going on that, that led to you being a bigger kid? Or do you think it was just a matter of, you know, you were taller and so your, your frame was kind of just built that way? I think it's a combination of both. Um, my parents were really good. We didn't have a lot of junk food. We didn't have a lot of food put out. But it was that typical 70s, or 80s mentality where it's on your plate, you must eat it. So even though I wasn't hungry, I learned at a very young age that whatever was given to me, I needed to eat. Um, so there were a lot of sort of 
negative habits reinforced into my relationship with food at an early age. And that's not necessarily my parents' fault. It's, you know, just, it's just the way that things were, I guess, here that, you know, um, you'd have your three square meals a day, you'd run around and do things as a kid and then you'd come home and you'd stuff your face and then go to bed full. Yeah. And I don't, I don't, think that that's necessarily even just something that was kind of going on just where you are i think that that now that you say that it was actually like a a worldwide thing because over here in the Mm. states we experience that as well like if the food was put in front of you it doesn't matter if you you know if it was your favorite food or not like that's what was for dinner that night and if you wanted to eat dinner that's what you were eating you know? Yeah. So I think that was a worldwide thing during that point in time. And even for us, it was if you didn't finish what was on your plate, then dessert was, you know, withheld as well. So at a very young age, I learned that I had to get through that food first and then there would be a reward at the end. So it was always treating a, a negative behavior of stuffing yourself to then get a sweet treat. And that, that they're sort of those habits that I built up over time. And as like we'll probably get into it a bit later, but um, I also found out a bit later on that I have a tumor on my pituitary gland, which also caused a few other issues and body changes as well. And we didn't know at that point, and it was undiagnosed for 20 years, that it was helping me gain weight without the ability to lose it. So all of that extra food was definitely not a help. And would you say you carried that, the you carried these habits um into like your young adulthood post uh, high school and I'm assuming that you know being as you're in the industry that you are in you had to go to some sort of secondary education post high school Um, so did you carry all of these habits with you when you went on to college or university yeah definitely Um, and they probably escalated and got a little worse as well as um, the social elements of life changed and I needed to be even more outgoing or I needed to do public speaking because naturally I'm quite a shy, um, anxious, sort of socially awkward person having to actually wear that mask, I guess, that hide behind your your fat and use that as your weapon or your sword or your shield against everything else around there and actually not let people know that they're getting to you. Being able to eat vast amounts of food also gave you the ability to be able to say, oh, look, let's have an eating challenge or it's a different way to connect with people or you'd be the one that would be invited along because you could help clear that last plate of food or, you know, the girls that you would hang out with would, you know, use you to sort of let's share a meal together because I know I'm going to eat three bites and you can eat the rest for me so it's not a waste of money. And that happened all the way through up until my mid-30s. Wow, that's that's very, very interesting. I would have never, I would have never put that together especially like the eating contest thing you know but in those early 20s and you know if you're out drinking with your buddies and having a couple beers or whatever it is like oh let's see if we can finish this whole pizza or let's see who can finish a whole pizza on their own and you know like or who's going to tap out first and you know if you were if you were a shy kid I could see how that type of a situation would be very attractive to you because it's a way to get out there and and meet new people or even just hang out with people that you know um, and and connect with them. Yeah, definitely. Um, And growing up the way I did with the family that I had, it was a very, very large family that every happy memory that we have is based around food. So every get-together was either a breakfast or a lunch or a dinner or you'd go from one side of the family to the other side of the family to have one barbecue here and then to have like a roast dinner at the other person's place. So everything centered around food. So that's where the happiness factor and the bad habits were built in because that satisfied that emotional need to sort of, or the food gave you that emotional comfort that you didn't get from other things. And so um, like emotionally, how were you feeling because you you were hanging out with people so it even as a shy kid it must have felt good to hang out with these people that you were hanging out with but at the same time did you kind of feel like you were almost doing something that you you shouldn't have been doing yeah in a way um the i guess the food gave that element of inclusion and 
it was the one thing that we all could do together. But I didn't realize at the time that the habits that I were building, or that I was building through, would carry on for such a long time and would impact a kid who may have only just been overweight to turning him into needing to keep on eating and with other conditions that were going on as well to force that overweight to obesity to obese level two and level three to the point where, you know, I was over well over 400 pounds by the time I hit 40 years old. And, you know, it's one of those things where as a single dad growing up in my mid early twenties that it was very, very hard to look at what choices and learning about the healthier side of food compared to having fun, eating whatever was there and just using that as a crutch, I guess, to cope with what else was going on in my life. And so you were almost, would you say that you were almost eating kind of as a way to cope with it as well? Like you were an emotional eater, um, as people sometimes call it. Yeah, definitely. Food was that, that one thing that it was a constant. It didn't change no matter what you were eating. That that even though you, I look back on it now and see that the feeling didn't last very long, the ability to be able to have something to eat that I enjoyed, it was something that everyone around me did as well. So it felt normal. And I felt normal at that point, even though I might have been a lot taller than everybody else or a lot larger, or a lot heavier. I was the guy at work in that special chair that had to have a, you know, an extra weight rated chair to be able to do my job. Yet, when we would go out drinking or we'd go out to dinner, it was the one thing that we all did together. So that brought a sense of normality into a life that was spiraling into chaos. And when you had to have that chair that had the, you know, the higher weight rating, um, or, you know, I don't, I'm not sure if it's the same, but you know, sometimes for some people, they, they go to a buffet and when they go to like an all you can eat buffet ever, you know, all eyes are on them essentially. Um, emotionally in those types of situations what were you feeling um well i guess that the chair thing it got to a point when my back started to degrade so i've now got two degraded discs and fusion in my spine because of the weight that i was carrying it was all front based as well so my spine was constantly being held forward and i needed medically to be able to have a chair that would support and help with my spine and at the same time, in Australia, like 200 weighted chair, um, so about 450 pounds to cope with my weight on the chair. It was just, it's a scary thought looking back on it now, but it was such a shame spiral to be able to say to my boss, look, I can't sit in these normal chairs. I've collapsed two of them and I've hidden them out the back. Um, you know, I'm great at my job, but I can't do it without some help now. And not once through any of the assistance programs through the company that I work with, did anyone even suggest to me, well, maybe we'll look at it on a different angle at the same time and help you with maybe diet, exercise, weight-related things. It was just, let's get you an apparatus that can help cope with your weight so you can continue doing your job. Um, And things like going to buffets, being the only person to sit on the end of a booth-style table because you could not get between the table and the the back of the chair. people always having to walk around you or you perching yourself on the very edge of a chair and using all of your quads to hold your body weight but look like you're sitting normally at the same time so you don't crush a chair. It's just the things that people don't realize that you put yourself through just because you want to fit in and be with normal people yet you're anything but. And and so how did that make you feel? I mean, did you have any feelings of embarrassment or or shame or was there any you know like depressions that you had gone through while you were going through all of these you know situations especially the the things that you know you just shared yeah definitely um but they were all internalized so every time i would feel bad it would i would put on that smile or that fake you know bravado or i'd make a joke out of it so i would turn myself into the joke so other people couldn't make fun of it because if I got in first, then it, it just removed any power that they had to be able to make me feel bad about myself because I'd already done it. And you know, you know, it's what's I guess not. I shouldn't say funny because it's that's really not the right word for it. But every person who I have talked to who has gone through a weight loss journey, who was at one point in time overweight, 
they say the same exact thing. Yeah. Uh, most of the people who I have talked to that were overweight all say, hey, you know what? When I was at the point that people started making fun of me, I figured out that if I made the joke first or if I said it first, you know, it was like this weird coping mechanism and, and it quote unquote didn't hurt as much when they, you know, when I said it first and I beat them to the punch and, you know, everybody was laughing. So then I got to laugh, you know, kind of with them instead of them laughing at me. And so it's just very interesting that, you know, that's a, a common, I guess, bond you could call it that 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 we all share is that that's such a yeah, it's, it's a coping mechanism that that we use it is and people who've never had a weight related problem don't understand how powerful words can be both using just the, the small word of calling someone fat compared to understanding that they might have fat but they are not fat um or to say or oh, you know when we go out tonight, we'll take him along because at least we know that there'll be nothing left on the table. Um, and turning it around and taking the power out of their words and putting them into your own is the only way that a lot of us could cope. So accepting the fact that, yes, we were going to get cold fat or we were going to be made fun of our size, if we were the first people to do that, then no one else had the power to make you feel bad. You've already chosen to accept that this is what it is and then you move past it. So then their comments become less and less powerful, but at the same time, you're reinforcing that negativity back into your own mentality. And so, you know, you were you were going through these times, and and you you had some some very deep depressions, and and at one point, you actually woke up in the morning, and you were sad that you woke up that morning. Um, so, can you talk to me about what was going on? specifically at that point in time and and why you you felt that way and why you felt almost sad to still be alive um so i'm i'm not the sort of person who would ever um do anything about those thoughts so i just want to make that clear now that even though i had you know i was sad that i'd woken up that day and that wasn't the first day i'd been sad about it um for me, it was more about how do I get through this next day because I know I'm going to wake up again like Groundhog Day and still be trapped inside of this body, still have these excessive amounts of pain where I was living on ibuprofen and paracetamol for breakfast um, because my body ached, getting up to move, walking more than a couple of hundred meters at a time and then having to sit down and rest while everyone else is surging ahead. It just became my normal and probably since... Mm, 2012 or 13 my job role changed and I started to get more and more customer facing with what I was doing and dealing with our state government and having to keep that false bravado on the pressures at work also built up there were problems at at home in my marriage as well um, and my weight kept on growing and growing to the point where every night I would just say maybe tonight I'll wake up and I won't feel this way in the morning and that turned into maybe I won't wake up in the morning and then no one will have to worry about, you know, hanging around waiting for me or that I won't go to work and have to sit there in that really big chair that's got a special note on the back saying, don't touch it, this is Will's chair. Um, and, you know, describing that they could actually throw my back out or, or try and have to get the paramedics to lift me off the floor because I can't physically get myself up and no one can lift me. So all of those things over time just kept on building up and building up to the point where Every morning when my alarm would go off, I'd actually wake up and I'd have a deep sorrow inside saying, well, I guess it wasn't my night, so I've now got to go through and do the best I can with my job in public safety and help other people survive and maybe get them a better quality of life because mine's just not going to change. So I started looking into options and seeing if I can't change it myself, what are the options I've got to actually start getting someone to help me make those changes. And... So I just want to take a step back really quick and, and and ask you, prior to going and exploring some of these options to make this change, to change your entire life, had you gone to the doctor at all 
leading up to this and and had they expressed any concerns about your weight or your eating or your diet um, or anything like that and how it was you know affecting your body and, and your physical and mental health it's, it's a bit of a yes and no answer to this so back in 2004 i went to the doctor and said i'm gaining weight yet i'm eating very little amounts of food i'm actually quite active i don't know what's going on and the typical doctor response was to not look too hard and say that you're eating too much eat less move more um that happened for a few years i changed doctors i said the same thing again and in late 2007 one doctor said look i don't know what's going on but i want to do this random test just to check it out and they checked my levels of prolactin in my blood, which is a hormone that helps usually pregnant women lactate to be able to feed the baby. And they found through this random test of a doctor just taking a chance and listening to what I was saying that I had a tumor on my um, pituitary gland, which was producing insane amounts of prolactin. So my body was in a pregnant female's lactating um, hormonal state and I was gaining weight. I was gaining things like, I'm not sure what you call them over there, but like man boobs. I was actually, you know, physically having very low levels of testosterone um, and all of those things with the inability to be able to move because of my weight caused extreme amounts of weight gain. And that lasted for probably about 10 years before it came under control. So my body was already in a fight and flight mode trying to deal with that. But luckily, my tumor can be controlled by drugs. So high, high amounts of drugs over time, it's now dropped down, but that helped get that part under control. But by that point, the weight gain and the damage had been done and my body was sort of changed in a way that it, it wouldn't just bounce back. There needed to be further things happening then. Um, but that then caused things like the back issues, so not being able to move as easily. Um, degraded disc, I've got a curve in my spine because of the fact that I would be so hunched over with being so tall and trying to hide my stomach, I would actually lean forward a lot to try and cover. Um, I'd wear clothes that sort of hung and covered my size. So even though people knew I was round, they didn't access it. They, you look at some of my larger pictures and people say, I don't believe you weighed over 430 pounds or I don't believe you weighed this amount of weight because you don't look like that. But I'm an extremely dense and muscular person underneath as well. So I'm going to weigh more than most people. And the doctors didn't look at it on a perspective of, what's causing this guy to be so heavy they just went you do something about it yourself they put me on things like duramine which is effectively legal speed to try and get me to not eat as much but i was only eating 800 to a thousand cal you know a thousand calories a day and that's at my largest so i wasn't stuffing in a lot of food in my later 30s yet i still couldn't lose weight and i was actually actively gaining and do they so, do they know what caused this tumor? The prolactinoma is actually the most common tumor in males in the world. Um, some people, diet and exercise can keep the effects under control, but it's not usually diagnosed and um, found as easily as it should be. Um, so it, it's just a rare thing that can happen, but it is the most common tumor in men in the world these days. And the so. It, are there any other symptoms aside from, you know, you're gaining weight even if you're exercising and, and eating properly? Is that really one of, is it one of the or the only sign? No, um, depending on where the tumor is on the pituitary gland. Um, so mine also grew so large that it pressed on the optical nerve in the cavity where the um, pituitary gland is. So I started to have my eyesight started to get a little funny. Um, I started to get like gray or blacked out spots um, I was getting headaches and some doctors put it all down to my back or my weight instead mm. of looking at maybe what else could be causing it and mm. I'm really grateful for this one doctor who was an overseas foreign doctor who came into a clinic in the western parts of Sydney and took a chance to listen to someone who when you look at the way society treats people with obesity they throw an all or nothing mentality at them where it's you are just lazy, you are not eating enough, or you are eating too much, you're not exercising, and they don't look at what could be causing that. And so now, you you know, you kind of have the, the tumor under control, and you can now begin to start to explore 
some of these options and take me kind of through that and why you decided to go with, you know, what you decided to go with and, and what were some of the things that you had to kind of take into account and think about while you were exploring all of these options. Yep. So late 2007, we started drug hormone therapy on my tumor, which helped it decrease over probably 18 months to, to years. Um, and at that point, I'd also just recently got married and we moved from New South Wales down into Victoria, where we are now. Um, so a few things were happening at the same time. I'd had a massive change in job. I used to work in public safety in New South Wales, but I used to work for a police department dispatching over the, the air, getting the cars to go places and helping coordinate incidents and do all that sort of stuff. And I moved into a more um, desk-based, non-shift work-related role. Um, and I'd moved away from my whole support network. So my wife had got back to her family, but yet I'd become isolated. So that sort of didn't help where even though the tumor was now getting under control and those effects were lessening, I coped in other ways of being lonely and unhappy and isolated by eating. You know, that's when I started to eat more food. Um, and a few friends from where I worked with police in New South Wales had actually had lap band surgery and they'd lost vast amounts of weight. Um, but I'd done some research into lap band and I wasn't happy with the way that it was actually restricting the esophagus or making that pocket in the stomach. I'd seen a lot of them have massive amounts of food-related issues, um, extreme malnutrition, or getting to the point where the band needed to be just have all the fluid let out of it because it was just useless. It wasn't helping them in their way, and I didn't think that was an option for me. So that was in 2009 and 10, and it took me all the way up to 2017 with various different levels of health issues to be able to say, enough is enough, what are my options? So I spoke to my my normal doctor and said, look, I need to investigate this. I need some other intervention, um, diet and exercise. I'd been with a personal trainer in 2014, 15, 16, exercise, changing the diet, um, eating smaller calorie amounts of food still wasn't helping me lose weight and there needed to be something drastic done. And the morning I woke up and I was extremely sad. I jumped straight when I got to work onto weight loss surgery websites and said, what do I need to do? What are the options that I think will suit me? And then how do I get in to speak to a surgeon or a specialist to be able to say, this is what I'm thinking, this is what's happened, this is where I think I need to be, and to get some professional advice because I knew that a normal doctor, the ones that I'd been dealing with for the past 10 or 15 years before that, just didn't have it in their head at that point and it's still, even though weight loss surgery is becoming something that is becoming a lot more commonplace, it's a very last option for a lot of doctors. And sometimes in the position I was in, it needed to be my first option. So I sat down with um, the surgeon. I actually researched who the surgeons were in my area. I found um, the person who was the head of not only the weight management clinics at the public hospital system, um, but is also the associate professor in this area and field as well. So I went for the best of the best. I sat down and I had a very open and honest talk with him um, and told him what my fears were, what I really wanted to achieve out of this and asked him with his experience what the reality was. If I did have this, where would I be physically? What weight could I get down to? What his expectations would be for the surgery compared to the risks um, and his closest and best answer was, even though there were risks with having this surgery, and yes, it is major abdominal surgery, we're removing 90% of your stomach, the risks of you staying obese and the way you are are far outweighed by your obesity compared to the risk of surgery. And that's when I knew I needed to do it. And so take me through that conversation. Like, what was that conversation like? And what were some of the fears that, that you had going into this surgery that were potentially holding you back from doing it? My biggest fear was even though I would wake up every day sad that I'd woken up, I didn't want to die on the operating table. And I'd never had any sort of major, you know, it, it's a 45 minute to an hour and a half procedure sometimes depending on what they find. But it was just food and the ability to 
that I built my coping me- mechanisms up around eating and being the fat person, I sat there and thought, what if I do lose weight? What if I am a success in respect of actually getting to the surgeon's goal weight or even my own personal goal? Who do I become after that? What do I do with my life once I no longer am inhibited by the weight? And that's what stopped me for months. It was actually the fear of my life is going to change if I do this and it might not change in a way that I've ever dealt with before. And I'm actually wearing clothes today that are smaller than what I wore in junior high school. And that in two years is a massive change in the personality of the person who's sitting there going, I've always had to be that funny fat guy. I've always hidden behind my weight and now that weight is no longer an option to hide behind. So I was really scared about who I'd become if it would change me as a person. If I did the surgery, would I fail at it? Um, You know, having the VSG like I've had, you can stretch that sleeve that they put in there and eventually some people actually gain all of their weight back. And what if I did all this and spent all of this money because I was also self-funded for this? You know, no no health insurance paid for mine. I paid for it myself. What if I waste all this money because I can't change who I am as a person and I still rely on food as a mechanism? So I ended up investing a lot of time into my head first and dealt with all of the head-related food issues and my self-confidence issues and all of that before I had my surgery. And it was probably the best thing I ever did. And so what were some of the things that you did there? Did, did you go and, and speak to a specialist? And how, what were some of the, the things that you changed in some of these habits that you went through? And, and how did you really change your relationship with food? Because it seems like from what, what we talked about earlier with your childhood, it doesn't seem as though you had a relationship with unhealthy foods you just had an unhealthy relationship with food itself and it was more of maybe the amount you were consuming and not necessarily what you were consuming. Definitely. Um, There is an element of when I moved out of home first off and then um, at 19 I became a single dad as well. So I put all my money and things that I could into my daughter and I would eat whatever was available. So there are elements of where even though I would be making healthy food, you know, it would be I'd have three times the amount I really should have been having or it was there and food, because we had so little money, I would make sure that I didn't waste it. So even if I didn't feel like it, I would finish everything that was there. Um, but once I decided on surgery, with a psychologist who actually works really well with bariatric patients, so... I've come to the realization and everyone I've spoken to recently about this has agreed as well that obesity is a symptom of a mental condition. And if you deal with what's going on in your head, like um, I'm still doing and you know, I spent a lot of time doing in the beginning, you actually find out why you're overeating. You actually find out all of the triggers that you have in relation to food, whether it's um, you get depressed and then something warm and sweet makes you feel good. So it helps release those endorphins or things that you can get in other ways when you know about that. But at this time, all you can think about is what can I get as a quick fix to make me feel better? And that for me was food. So certain sweet things um, were really, really good at helping me feel better about myself. So I would sit there and eat a block of chocolate while I was doing my work because it actually made me feel happy that it was just dealing with that emotional need of food. Um, But taking away those habits and understanding why I was eating instead of actually just going, this is what I do to get this job done. I started to look at what can I do external to food that can give me the same feeling. Um, And our pre-surgery diet over here in Australia is to do something called OptiFast where it's a very low calorie meal replacement shake. Um, And I'd tried that before and I did it for nearly three months and I'd lost a lot of weight, so probably close to 80 pounds when I did it. Um, But as soon as I stopped, because I'd never dealt with how I related to food and why it was triggering me to eat so much and why certain foods gave me a certain feeling, that I would put all that weight back on, but then I would put more on because my body was searching for more and more and more. So the psychologist helped me understand why I ate and then the dietitian that we have to see because it's like a pre-surgery pack where you need to see a psychologist, a dietitian, they have to approve on you getting the surgery. 
um, because the surgeon I went to running the weight management clinics had said, I'm not going to operate on you if you're not going to take it seriously. Um, yes, there are risks and a lot of surgeons will just, you know, not really speak to you. They'll just put you in because they want that money. I'm here to make sure that you live. And part of that is you dealing with your head first, because if you don't deal with your head, the surgery will force you to lose weight. But if you don't change your behavior, you'll put it all back on and there's no point. It's just a waste of your money and my time. And how thankful are you for that surgeon saying that to you? I owe that surgeon my life. Um, I couldn't have made those choices without him helping me map out that six months between when I wanted to have surgery and when I got surgery. Um, I was initially scheduled to go in for surgery on the 5th of December 2016, but it got pushed back into the 11th of May 17, and that's that six months where I spent working on myself. And because I was so motivated to not wake up and feel sad anymore, I did everything I needed to do, and I pushed myself beyond every comfort barrier that I had I sat there at night and spoke to my wife about how I was feeling about myself, um, what we could do in the house to change things. So we started removing certain food items and slowly and gradually moved it to healthier and healthier options. We would then change from eating on a dinner plate to like an entree style plate or I think you guys call them appetizer plates. Um, And to move the physical amount of food I could eat would be sized down every time I would eat so that way I got to a point where my body didn't need that amount of food to feel full. And then moving on to the diet that the surgeon said I had to do, I did four and a half weeks of two cups of vegetables a day that were low starch, and then every other meal was a liquid meal replacement shake or like a protein-style bar that was very low calorie. And it shrunk my liver, it shrunk my stomach to a point where it could um, give me that full feeling, but obviously after 30 years of having a stomach that was so well stretched, it just didn't pull back in. So when they did my surgery, they ended up taking out 90% where most people have sort of 85% to 80% and they're they're left with a 20% or a 15% stomach. Mine's actually been done to one of the smallest that the surgeon's done. And so um, just as you were kind of coming out of this surgery and, you know, getting back into it, well, before you went in for the surgery, was there an amount of weight that they told you you needed to lose before you had surgery? Because I have heard that before as well. And it's kind of for some some varying reasons. Uh, One of the main reasons that I've heard, though, is that because you're going under anesthesia, uh, you have to be at a a certain weight when you're going under the anesthesia because it, it really just kind of decreases Um, the chances of something happening. So was there a point that you had to be at before you went under for your surgery? Because the surgeon that I went through operates with the biggest of the big here in Australia and in Melbourne specifically, um, I was already under the operatable weight limit. But what his goal for me was I needed to shrink my liver. So when they do the laparoscopic surgery, um, They actually use a liver retractor and it's like a metal snake that grabs your liver and holds it up out of the way so they can actually operate within your abdominal cavity. And if your liver is really fatty, really heavy, it flops around and there's a chance that you can get a cut or a bleed and actually it causes massive issues where you could actually die on the table. And he did not hold anything back when he explained it to me. He said, look, I can operate operate on you with the size that you're at. I can't operate on you with the size of liver you have. And he was very blunt with that and said, I need you to do this. You don't. I'm not worried about the amount of weight you lose as much as the amount of fat you can cut out of that liver. Um, and I want you to do this diet for two weeks. I then did it for four and a half weeks due to the fear I had of actually having that liver problem or dying on the operating table. So, so you, I extended it myself. I was going to say, so you, you kind of went above and beyond. Yeah, it's a pretty much a theme. If I can eat, I would eat above and beyond. And with surgery, I decided that, you know, if I'm going to do this, what's the point of going in halfway? A lot of people have what they call a food funeral where they'll actually, right before they start their pre-surgery diet, they will have a blowout and eat everything they possibly could. I literally started my pre-surgery diet the day after my wife's birthday and I'd made like a really nice steak dinner. Um, beautiful food. There wasn't a lot of it, but it was something that I knew would give me that last remainder of happiness from food before I said, 
that's it. You know what? Things have to change, and if I don't do it myself, what's the point? And and they did change. They changed significantly because in one of the pictures that I saw, you wrote in the caption that you were actually wearing a 9XL T-shirt, and then kind of over the course of the, the, the next two pictures, you know, you described how much weight you lost, and you also described that over that point in that that period of time you also found your smile and so talk to me about post-surgery and what happened you know immediately after surgery you know those first few kind of weeks and months and then kind of how time has has progressed for you so post-surgery I think I came out of hospital day three and went home with zero painkillers I actually came out really well um and my body coped quite well with the reduction of stomach. Um, and we start on, on a liquid phase, so clear liquids, and then you can get into some purees, and then you go into soft foods. And all through those stages, they're about two to three weeks long, and you really need to listen to your body at that point. And I started to notice certain foods and certain densities of food and certain types of food made me feel good compared to make me feel bad. And that's when it clicked in my head that no matter what I'd eaten pre-surgery, this is a whole new ball game here, that I have a chance to rebuild the way that my body reacts to food as well. So I started to do a lot of nutritional research. And the one thing I'll say about my surgeon is that the dietitian he had was crap. So I was told I could eat things like um, breaded fish fingers in week three. And that caused a lot of health. <laughs> a lot of pain and a lot of uh, what we call dumping syndrome where it made me very sick very quickly. So I started to look and listen to what my body told me it was requiring and um, I had a lot of things like bone broth or vegetable soups um, and then when I moved into purees I then started to incorporate fresh vegetables and those sort of things and weight just started to drop off dramatically. So. My stomach is at a point where I can eat between quarter to half a cup of food at any time. But then I have to wait probably 20, 30 minutes at the start before it would digest enough that I could eat anything else. And by that point, I wasn't hungry. So I would eat probably maybe three quarters to a cup of food a day for the first couple of months, um, all nutritionally dense, um, really healthy food full of all the micronutrients that I needed to cope, um, take my micronutrients. Uh, my multivitamins and my body just started to change but I lost a lot of weight very quickly going from the size that I was without all of that extra food and also without the tumor related problems my body started to heal very quickly um, and I went from uh, I'm trying to convert the pounds but I probably lost about 60 to 80 pounds within five weeks um, and so uh, one question that, that immediately popped into my head there, and it was because you, you kind of just made a joke about it as well. When you were coming out of surgery and only eating about a half a cup to it, most like a cup of food per day, and the key that you said there that I, that I really grabbed onto was that you said you felt full. Yeah. Now, did you ever feel full before the surgery? And... When, like, I wonder what flipped that switch if you did not feel full before you had the surgery? Um, part of the problem with my stomach was that it was extremely damaged and stretched. So no matter what I put into it before surgery, I would be able to eat and it would digest very quickly. So I could never get to a point where I would get that full feeling because I damaged all of those nerves and receptors on the outer part of the like the large curve of the stomach. So it would just stretch and stretch and stretch. I would notice when I would eat that I would get a like a protruding stomach. And to me, that was like, oh, you've actually had a really good time because you've got a fatter belly today. And going after surgery, um, where they cut all of my stomach off and also with the very small size that my VSG sleeve is, I could actually feel the food. So when I drink now, if I drink something cold, I can actually feel it making all of my staples and the titanium like over so I can actually feel it making my stomach contract I can feel what my stomach is doing where before I had no feeling at all wow that's interesting was that weird at first 
it's still weird now, <laughs> nearly two years on. Yeah, yeah, I, I would imagine. And so did you, I'm assuming that you've now increased to, you're having more than just a cup of food per day. Um, but judging by your pictures and your attitude and your smile and everything else, um, some of those food choices probably haven't changed too much and you're probably still focusing on some of those very nutrient dense foods so uh, what does a, a kind of like a typical day of of eating look like for you right now uh so my sleeve though is still really small so i've got what they refer to as restriction quite heavily um so i can still only get per meal up to maybe a half a cup at most in but the good thing that I've had is since week eight after surgery, I've been back at the gym and I was actually with a personal trainer who had not had weight loss surgery, but had had lost a lot of weight naturally and then had skin removal. So his understanding of what I was going through and what I needed to achieve was actually a lot greater than a lot of normal personal trainers. So I'd actually chosen him. I met him via Instagram as well, which is why I love Instagram so much. It's given me a life that I never thought I could have. And connected me with people that I would never have met normally. And what Taylor did for me is he actually helped me work out nutritionally what I needed to eat. He then gave me the idea of I needed to start eating more regularly, which is a lot of people don't work this way. And this is only, I, I will say it now, based upon my experience with my body and everyone will be different. But I started to eat more regularly and more calorie dense food. So a lot of my friends now refer to when we eat together, what sleep do you have now, Will? Because my metabolism is extremely fast and my digestion is quite good as well. So I'll probably eat now two and a half to 3,000 calories a day and I'm still losing body fat because of the way that we've actually rebuilt my internals. And so you are also, are you still working with a personal trainer then as well? Because that was actually going to be one of my questions is if it was, you know, just your diet that you changed or you know now obviously you're in the gym and you said it was it was eight weeks post surgery you were allowed to go back into the gym yeah so i I'd, I'd done sort of home workouts or my where i live we have a gym within our um suburb and i would go there and just do the very bare minimum but then i started to go to a, a gym with a personal trainer and the act of paying for that made me realize that i needed to turn up and that was my only motivation at this point was I'm still, I was at probably at the 340 to 360 pounds when I started at the gym. Um, and that was already after naturally losing a lot of weight just after surgery with just diet changes and then incorporating the exercise. I started to feel those hunger feelings again, but it's something that I've now built as a habit. So even though my trainer and I are no longer training like that, we're still really great friends and we will train as friends, you know, at times. And I've now got my habits down into a pat where I, I will actually go and do my uh, my 10,000 steps a day or I'll go for a run or um, when I've got really intense work times on, I'll adjust the amount of food that I'm eating to, to be able to balance things out. So, um, But exercise and fitness and diet have now become a massive part of my life where before that was the last thing I thought of. And so what do you think the biggest – contributing factor was to changing your relationship with food um understanding that all food is not equal was the biggest thing that i've learned that you can have a whole plate of salad and to most people they would think oh a, a, whole, a massive plate of salad is a lot healthier than eating a small plate of like fries for instance but volume also matters and a lot of people don't realize that they could be eating a massive portion of salad and still stretching their stomach. So they're going to get hungrier quicker. They're not going to feel as full. They're going to need to eventually put more and more food in there, no matter whether it's high-quality, nutrient-dense food or not. And it will give them that stretched stomach feel. So if they're not careful with what they're putting in, as well as that volume, it's, no matter what you do, you know, it's a lot of your weight and a lot of the way things can happen is going to be based around the diet or in the kitchen where physical exercise has a massive you know, impact on your life. But if you're not eating the right stuff and you're not eating in the right proportions or like me, where if I'm not eating regularly enough, 
I'll actually start to put on weight if I actually reduce the amount of food that I eat because my body's no longer burning as much as actually starting to store instead of burn through things. So understanding how I react to different quality of food and also different amounts of food and then the different types of food has been probably the biggest thing for me. Yeah, I found that myself as well. And it's specifically with um, things that have a lot of grease, things that are fried. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, you, you probably run into this as well. And we ha- we didn't really get a chance to kind of talk about any of the specific foods that, you know, you, you really honed in on um, when you were eating and you were overweight. But, you know, for me, I... I really enjoy things like burgers and, you know, like barbecue type things. And so I have found now that when I eat something, like if I go to a restaurant and I get a burger and it, it sometimes doesn't even have to be, you know, a fast food restaurant like McDonald's or anything like that. It could just be a burger from a regular restaurant. I feel bloated afterwards I feel sluggish I just don't feel good when I eat something like that from a restaurant and I don't know if it's because it's the way that it's prepared or maybe it's the beef that they're using is a higher fat content I haven't quite figured it out the why behind it but I just know that when I eat that food I can feel a difference and I think that that comes from being so aware of what you are consuming. And so because you became so aware of what you were consuming, especially post-surgery, I think it just makes you hyper aware of how certain foods make you feel. And so I always Definitely. I always feel better eating a burger that I prepared myself at home you know, on the grill and I know exactly what it was seasoned with and I know exactly how it was actually prepared on that grill and was it like, you know, was the grill covered in a bunch of grease from like the 15 other burgers that were cooked before it? I don't know. Whereas at home, I know exactly how it's being prepared and I know exactly how it's being cooked. So I I, I haven't quite figured it out. But like I said, I, I think it's just becoming hyper aware of what you're consuming. Um and having such a healthy relationship with food. Definitely. And like, I'll be the first to admit, I still eat like a normal person. So my relationship with food is a very balanced one where I will still have things like chips or, um, you know, fries or ice cream, but they're in a lot smaller amounts. Uh, I don't deny myself any food. I just know that if I have a, what some people refer to as a blowout day, that I increase my physical exercise the next day, I increase my water intake. Um, if I've had a lot of salty food, then you know it's definitely hydration becomes an issue and I need to flush that through. And understanding why things work the way they do with the way my body reacts to it has been the best thing possible. That, as you said, like a homemade burger is a lot better than a, you know, a McDonald's burger, for instance. And as much as I can eat things like you know, McDonald's nuggets or those sort of things, the homemade food that I have is the stuff that I prefer the most now where before buying food from a restaurant was the the best way I think I could describe of getting happiness from food where now preparing something at home on a smaller plate gives me just that same amount of feeling without all of those problems that come after it. And do you think that's associated with the way that you feel after eating those foods, you know, just physically or, you know, there's also like a mental aspect after you eat McDonald's yeah. for, for those of us who don't eat McDonald's on a regular basis, you know, even mentally after you have McDonald's, you know, that, that that's something that you shouldn't have done. You know that it's not good. Um, so do you think it's more of the mental or it's more of the physical or it's kind of like a combination of the two that now you, you feel better eating something that you prepared yourself yeah um i I think a lot of people may not agree with me on this but i think places like mcdonald's and kfc and um you know like a fish and chip style shop or subway i think they all have a part in the food you know life cycle for every single human being whether they're a regular thing whether they're not is where it comes down to for me in that 
if I'm driving somewhere and I've got like a 10 hour drive, I'm quite happy to be able to go and eat something like McDonald's nuggets or some fries or that sort of stuff over getting a salad because I look at it and think, well, if I eat this now, I know that the calories are a little higher. The way I'm burning calories, I'm actually going to get a little bit more benefit out of it. People talk about good and bad calories, but your body operates on it. Is it a calorie or is it not a calorie level? Yes, there are micronutrient and macronutrient sort of requirements that your body has, but they're manipulatable now for me. And I'm not scared of having some junk food as such and then having some healthy food. And I know that I'm going to feel a little junkier after the junk food and a little healthier after the healthy food. So if I can balance the two out and maybe have nuggets with a side salad later on or those sort of things, then for me, that balance is what gives me the lifestyle that I've now been able to get. I can go out with friends on a Friday night and we can have things like a kebab or, um, you know, I can eat such a small amount of it, but at least I can still be with my friends doing those things and concentrating on the relationships that I have and not let food be the dictating factor. But feeling good from food is now no longer my priority where pre-surgery it was. And so because food was such a key component of relationships for you when you were in your younger years, how has that transitioned? And and have you actually seen some of your personal relationships with friends become stronger because you're now focused on, you know, hanging out with them and being part of the group, maybe as opposed to being focused on just the food aspect of being in a group. Yeah, definitely. So now when we go out for dinner and things, I'm more focused on the conversations and the people that are there and enjoying, you know, reacting and interacting with them compared to what's coming out of the kitchen. Um, So we're, we're trying different places for food or we'll try different venues or different themes Um, because we're now all focused more upon what do we get from each other instead of what do we put in our mouth. The food definitely has a portion to it, and we might choose one week it might be let's go to a brewery and actually have, you know, some sample beer and then, you know, some meals afterwards. And, um, you know, it could be that it's a friend's birthday, so we'll have something, you know, their favorite type of food, but it's those interactions now that drive me to be able to go and actually associate and, to interact and to have those times instead of actually, oh, what are we eating? No, I don't want to go because it's not something I feel like eating. And the relationships have become a lot stronger. And some of them have actually disappeared because now I can't eat with people. They don't know how to connect with me on that level as well. So there has been good and bad. And I mean, I know that there's there has to be so many things that are satisfying about your journey and and where you came from and you know where you are right now and kind of where you're looking to go from here but what are like maybe the most one to three satisfying things that have come out of this journey Uh, the first thing is i put in a post the other day is that i've actually lost size but i've gained my smile and that has more of a, to me, more of a meaning than not just the smile itself is that I've learned to like myself again, where post-surgery, even though I knew I was a decent person, I didn't like who I was and I didn't like looking in the mirror. Um, and it's given me that self-worth and self-confidence that I knew that I should have about myself that I could never actually get myself to believe that I was worth having Um, it's made me value myself more, I guess. The next biggest thing, I guess, would be being able to walk into a clothing store, into a normal section, and grab something that doesn't have an X in front of it and put it on and know that it will fit. So I can actually enjoy things like fashion or, um, you know, be able to fit into a a theme for a costume event. Um, And last year I went to a... um, like it's called the Oswide um, weight loss surgery meetup last year and I actually wore a suit that was a summer suit so it's shorts and a short length suit jacket but it was in a size that was smaller than my high school clothes um, it was covered in flamingos and I would never have worn anything with color let alone animals on it before mm-hmm. surgery um, and 
It was like a party suit and I was able to go out and have fun with my friends and not worry about being the biggest person in the room or not care about how I felt and just be able to enjoy expressing myself with my friends in whatever way I felt I wanted to and not have that fear of people are looking at me yet again. I actually wore something that made people look at me for that pure reason to challenge how I felt about myself. And the last thing, there's a video on my Instagram probably about a year and a half ago of where I was getting into my car and I've got a car that like in Australia, we've got a lot of Asian built cars, but I had to buy an American built car for the pure size of the way I was and the way that the seats were that I would fit in. And I could, you could see me getting into the car and getting in my stomach grabbed hold of the steering wheel while my butt was already on the seat. And to be able to sit in my car now and have to actually pull that seat all the way forward and actually sit closer to the steering wheel and have my head not rubbing on the roof because my butt's not lifting me that high up in the car, those physical changes to me are the most important things in the world because they show me that I've actually gained a life and a self-respect and an appreciation for myself and what I can achieve. And now I feel like the blinkers are taken off and I can see the rest of the world around me and whatever I want to achieve is now possible. Yeah, it's it's funny that you mentioned the, that kind of throwback Instagram video because just a couple of weeks ago I also posted something that I had posted quite a while back from when I was, you know, kind of just starting my weight loss journey and it was something so small and it wasn't a picture of a scale, it wasn't a picture of you know, like this, this massive transformation or anything like that. It was a picture that I had taken in the morning while I was brushing my teeth because the way that I was holding my toothbrush, I could actually see some definition in my shoulder for the first time really ever. And I I wrote in the caption that, you know, when you're on this weight loss journey, you need to look for those non-scale victories and and just like you were saying in in being able to move your your car seat up and not have your stomach touching the steering wheel and not have your head touching the roof and you know for me being able to see definition in my shoulder that could have been a week where I didn't see the scale move in numbers but I saw something you know a, a change in my body and and I think that that speaks many many volumes and and sometimes many more volumes many more volumes than than a scale victory and so i i think that that is something that's very very important when it comes to you know whether you're just starting your weight loss journey you're in the middle of your weight loss journey you just hit a plateau i i think that looking in other areas is definitely something that's going to keep you motivated and keep you going. And even just something like you were just talking about, where you wore a suit that actually made people look at you, as opposed to before you would wear clothing that, like when somebody, if somebody did look at you, they wouldn't really notice how big you were. And so I think that those changes are very, very important to notice and recognize and and celebrate and share and tell people about when you are on this weight loss journey. Most definitely. And the thing for me is I now no longer base my self-worth on stepping on a scale. So weight, in to put it in a very nerdy term, is your effect from gravity against the planet. And my effect in my own head now is how's your body fat, mate? You know, if you're losing body fat, it doesn't matter what the scale says as long as you're healthy. And I've I've probably gone up about maybe eight pounds or so, but at the same time I've gone down two clothing sizes and that non-scale victory for me is the best thing possible because I'm no longer controlled by stepping on a device that's going to make me feel bad about myself. The BMI is never something that's worked for me. That scale is a very, very much a one-size-fits-all thing, and it doesn't take into consideration my heritage, so my bone structure, my muscle density, or anything else. It tells me that I'm still obese or I'm Mm -hmm. overweight. Yet when you look, when I went to my plastic surgeon and got my quotes done a week and a half ago, he actually said, I can see that you've lost all of your body fat, and what you've got now is just localized pockets of fat within very thick skin from being so overweight, and they're not things you're going to lose by diet and exercise anymore. There are things that you cannot change 
without this physical, you know, surgery to remove that. So you need to be really happy with where you're at because even though your weight may be the 225, 228 pound mark, you're actually very lean for someone who is your height and your size already. And the scale is not going to give me that validation, but walking into a store and buying a size 34 pants when I used to wear a size 65 pants or bigger with a drawstring or an elastic waist are the things that now motivate me. And so I, I know that um, specifically in your, your post that you did for weight loss stories, you, you had a tip there for, for people who are just getting started. But um, if that's the same tip that you'd like to share now, you know, that's that's totally fine. Um, but if there is another one that, that you could share, um, could you just give us a tip? And it doesn't necessarily have to be centered around someone who's starting a weight loss journey, um, but someone who is just thinking about or getting ready to start their journey and they're a little nervous. I mean, think back to the way that you felt when you were, you know, looking around for a surgeon who was going to be willing to help you. Um, what is just one piece of advice that, that you could give someone who is in that position? Probably the best advice I can ever give anybody, no matter what their journey is and no matter which way they want to try and improve themselves, is your head is the biggest thing to work on. So understand why those behaviors you have make you do what you do. Work out how you're getting triggered or what forces you to make those decisions and then work out a way to actually deal with the underlying issues because once your head's in the right frame of mind and once you've focused on the things that you need to do and you've dealt with all of the triggers, no matter what step you take, it's a good step in the right direction and you will get to a goal that you set for yourself. But if your head's working against you, you'll take a step forward and two steps back. Well, Will, I just want to take this moment to say thank you for reserving some time to, to come on the podcast with me and for sharing your story with us here and really going deep into some of the ways that you were feeling um, and some of the things that you were going through you know, specifically just before the surgery and leading up to the surgery and some of the things that you were nervous about and just overall sharing your story and being so open. Um, I, I just really want to take a minute to recognize you for that and really just say thank you uh, for coming on and, and sharing that with us. I, I really appreciate it. And I know that the listeners of the podcast are going to appreciate that as well. It's my pleasure. If my journey can help just one person make that change, then that's why I started Instagram. That's why I, you know, I'll, I'll do things like this is because I didn't find anyone that gave me that sense of hope or to be able to look and see, hang on a minute, this may be possible. I know I'm going to have to work on myself, but if I can look at certain people out there and say they were like me and now look at them and it gives them that hope to make that one step forward, then, you know, Fantastic. Well, Will, thank you so much again. Um, I really look forward to sharing this episode uh, with the listeners, and I hope that uh, we can continue to, to stay connected and uh, you know share our journeys together um, with people on Instagram and, and here on the podcast. And uh, that'd be great. I'd love it around the world. So, so thank you so much. Thank you so much. What an incredible, incredible story of transformation and determination and the part that, that really sat with me was the doctor that really took the time to work with Will and really show him that he needed to be serious about this and I think and I'm sure Will will agree that that really ingrained some habits and some kind of mental toughness in him um, which has led to him being able to continue and stay on this journey that he is on so thank you so much to will for carving out some time to come on to the podcast and thank you so much to you the listener who came over to hang out with us 
on this morning, evening, or afternoon. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to hang out with us. And I really enjoy getting the chance to share these amazing stories with you of people who are doing it for themselves. So I look forward to sharing another fantastic weight loss journey with you next week. And until then, I hope the rest of this week and leading into your weekend is absolutely amazing. I will see you then. Thank you.